Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do the Math. I'm Michael. My name is Augustia. For Math Homework Club call in Bakersfield 636-4357, anywhere else 1-866-636-6284, email do the math at, at kern.org, online at do the math dot net and also on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. All right, nicely done right there. So Augustia, you, where do you go to school? On Stockdale. So you go to school at Stockdale, and what grade are you in? Fourth. How is fourth grade going? Good. Do you like, what, what do you like about fourth grade so far? Um, maybe math and science. So you like math and science. Well, we're gonna get to some of the math today. What do you like about fourth grade science? Um, like the projects we do. So do you do things together in class or did you do a science fair project or do you like, do both of those things? We do both of those things. Um, we had a science fair and but I was gone out so I couldn't do the science fair. But if you could have done the science fair, do you know what kind of project you would have done maybe or would have liked to do? Yeah. What would you have done, do you think? I would have done like a maybe um, volcano one, probably. Okay, so the reactions that yeah. form that? Yeah. What kind of things have you done in science that make you like science this year? Do you remember any of the things that you've studied or have done? Um, about like the environment and the human body, uh, cause we did one about like, um, project that what if you live near a mountain where there were lots of landslides and the other one was about human body, um, the fingers of your bone. So we made a model so um, you could pull a rope down um, that could bend the fingers. And you could see how each of the different parts would move? Yeah. And how some, you know, there are different parts, right? There's a lot of bones yeah. in the hand. Yeah. Right? Flanges? Yeah. Did you guys learn that? Um, not the name of the parts, but like the moving and stuff. Okay. Tendons and did you guys get into that a little bit? Huh. But you, now you also talked about landslides, right? Yeah. Living near mountains. What did you learn about that? So like um, we watched a video about I think there's a link signs from Doug um, So in that we learned um, He told us what landslides look like so we watched many videos in that mm -hmm. and um, discovered more things and our teacher gave us a paper and she um, told us to draw a, um, um, a picture of like you living um, and there's a mountain behind you and how would you protect your house from that. Okay, and that's something that kind of recent with California weather with all of the rain yeah. in the past couple of months, right? A lot yeah. of places were in danger of landslides and actually happened and things like that. Yeah. So it's good that you're learning about that in fourth grade. You ready to do a math problem? Yep. All right, let's take a look at today's problem of the day that was presented on social media. And we had a lot of people, they put in their answers for this. And uh, we're going to work through it together right now. So can you read the math problem of the day for me? 0 0.6 times 0 0.7. Perfect. Now, instead of saying 0 0.6, do you, know, do you know another way to say that instead of 0.6? Um, Have you learned decimal place value yet? I don't know how to say it, but 
we have learned about. Okay, so tell me if this sounds familiar. Six tenths. Yeah. Okay, so if the first one is six tenths, what's the second one? Seven tenths. Seven tenths, right? So if we didn't even have decimals in there, let's just say it was six times seven, what would that be? Um, four, 42. 42. Now, is 42 one of our options up there? Yep. It's B, isn't it? Yeah. Now, do you think it's really 42? No. Why not? Because it's a decimal. Because it's got decimals. So we know it's going to have to be one of the other ones. Yeah. So which one do you think it might be? Because you haven't worked with decimals yet, have you, in fourth grade, as far as multiplying them? Kind of. Kind of. All right. So we're kind of going to take a shot at this. So which one do you think it might be? A. Why A? Because um, if you multiply 6 times 7, you get 42. And there's a zero, so you put point zero. So you feeling good about that answer? Yeah. So you think in 0 0.42, well, Augustia says 0 0.42. Let's see if he's correct. A is correct. Hey, dude, nice problem right there. Yeah. One for one on the first problem. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. Hey, we do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays between 3.30 and 5.30. Phone numbers are at the bottom of your screen periodically throughout the program. But it is time now for today's Math in the News. And today's Math in the News, I can tell you that every day for Math in the News, we try to look for topics that are very current in the news uh, within a couple of days of the show because we are only on Tuesdays and Wednesdays live, uh, preferably the day of. But this one actually occurred the hour of <laughs> before coming on the show today. So I uh, was coming in to uh, get ready for the program today, fortunate enough to meet Julie. Mm -hmm. And you guys were in a meeting talking about some video production that you guys were putting together. But first of all, before we get to that, let us know who you are and why you were at this office and your association with the office. Well, I'm Julie Parsons, and I was actually um, an employee of this office for about 34 years. Okay. I retired in 2016, but well, that didn't go well. Congratulations on that, you. though. But it didn't go well, the retirement. You want to keep I, coming back, I eh? I got very bored. <laughs> so I came back, and I'm doing some consulting now for Kern County for early education, preschool, and transitional kindergarten. I'm also working with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, doing, again, some similar things around uh, training teachers. Well, that's awfully nice of yeah. Kern County to allow you to work with L.A. County also, because you were here. I was and here. And was it in the same capacity that you worked for this office for all of those other years? Or different things were you? I did different things in okay. this office, but my final years were um, working in curriculum instruction for um, the California Preschool Instructional Network. So it was working with and training preschool teachers. And then when transitional kindergarten legislation mm -hmm. was introduced, I started working with transitional kindergarten teachers as well. So is that something the that they said, Julie, we really need to work with this group of people? Or did you say, I would like to work with that group of people and that age student? It or made was it a mix? Sense. It made sense um, because of my background and my knowledge in early education. And because transitional kindergarten students are actually preschool age, um, they're just getting that extra time in transitional kindergarten to grow a little bit. But the ages are the same. Okay. So because when I was growing up, and most of us as adults, we were growing up, there was no transitional kindergarten. It was just you went to kindergarten. So what, for students that aren't familiar with it, what is transitional kindergarten the aim for that? The, the aim for transitional kindergarten when it was implemented about 12 years ago, I think, was when we did the pilots, was the children that were the very youngest coming into kindergarten, so those very young children who had just Right at the cutoff date, right? Yeah, were very, very young. And there was um, two kindergarten teachers actually up in the San Jose area that went to their local legislator and said, what can we do? Because these children are too young. They, and they really needed that social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the basis of transitional kindergarten, was to give those children an opportunity to grow socially and emotionally so that they are 
more prepared to go into or the other learning in the other classes. The, yes, to go into the K-12 system. So they just weren't quite ready yet. And a lot of students, I mean, I'm talking to kids, a lot of times they don't have the opportunity to have other students around them until they are presented with that, right? Because it's like, all right, well, you're going to go to kindergarten, but they've never been around a group of kids like that before. Right, unless they've gone to a preschool right. program. Right, well, what I'm saying is a lot of times if they're a stay at home, exactly. they're only there with their siblings or sometimes only with the adult that is there with them. Absolutely. And so this was really that opportunity to allow them to start developing those skills that they needed, simple skills, but just just going to school for the first time and coming into an environment where there were different children, a, di a teacher now, mm -hmm. uh, routines. You know, what do we do first, second, third, what, right. what's happening? Right, and that routine is very important so that they know, oh, as soon as I get to school, this is what we're going to be doing. This is what expected of me. This is where we're going to be going next. I know who that person is. Right, and they didn't like have that. that. And then that building relationships, that was really a, a critical piece to this because we know that the, the, the first teacher that a child has <laughs> It's a, it's a critical position to be in you know, because you've got to build that relationship so that that ch child then, their first experience is, is a good one. It's it, a positive one with it, that adult. It's funny you say that because there are, I believe, people meant to be kindergarten teachers <laughs> that excel at it. And I remember, I mean, it's been many moons since I was a kindergarten student, but I do remember Mrs. Roberts, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. you kind of remember certain instructors that you've had. But as you say, the first one, you know, or even the first couple are very instrumental in how the rest of that education goes for that student. Absolutely. Now, you were talking about some of the simple skills, and I know we've got some video footage of some students working on some mathematics. Um, right. Well, th what we're seeing here is um, I was in a school site the other day, and this was some boys working with blocks. And, you know, they're having fun. First of all, let me say that play is really a child's work at this age. And, but they learned so many skills during that play. So they're mm -hmm. building with blocks. Now they're measuring. So we've got some measurement. We were also talking during that time about, you know, which, which stack of blocks was higher, which one was lower, which one was wider. And then we started comparing the children. The children were standing next to the blocks so that they okay. could see, you know, how, much, how many themselves. more do I need so that, it's, so that this structure is as tall as I am. The other thing they were doing was they were building. They were engineers that day. They and then they get to start developing, all right, if I want it taller, maybe I need to make it more stable at the bottom, exactly. things like that. And when does it fall over? I wonder why that point, happened. Right, why? why and did I that think happen? the key with this also is because of them going to TK, getting ready for the rest of the system, working collaboratively is the key, I think, also. Because a lot of times, they, well, I want to just do it myself. Well, there are times when you can do things yourself but you're going to find more benefit when they can start. And if they start early, working together, talking about problems together, solving them together, and finding out, well, I know that's one way to do it, but there are 18 other ways to do it. Let's see if we can find some more of those. Absolutely, and that's part of that social-emotional skill that they need to develop in working together, being around other children, problem-solving, conflict negotiation. Um, all of those things are skills that they need while they're learning. That's the key. Conceptual understanding of math and science and language. Just the language itself in building those blocks could have been new language for them. Right. It was all math language. Language of the discipline. Exactly. And math is a discipline and, and it has all, its language. And it all happens at the same time. All of those things. And the key is if they're having fun doing it. They have to be playing. Which is why we always like to make sure that the students are having fun when they're on Do the Math as well. I think Play we have another <laughs> uh, clip here of a young lady uh, doing some counting also. Yes. Let's take a look at this. Okay, let's count them again. One. One. Uno. How many do you have all together? Cinco. Cinco. Very good. High five. Very good. How many clouds? How many all together? Trace, right. So there's an example right there. And just a side note, if the student can do it in both languages, mm. an even bigger benefit there. There you go. So we've got some blocks for you. Right. So 
in the in the video what what we noticed what you saw was the little girl understanding cardinality that the the number of blocks that she was counting mm -hmm. all together was five but that's there's a process to the development and understanding of cardinality. First children have to count, right? One, two, three, four, five. They have to have that one-to-one -one correspondence. Correct. Because a lot of times children in the very beginning stages will go one, three, four. And, and they don't have going. that one-to-one. -one. So it takes practice. And some children, when you say, how many do I have all together? They'll say one, two, three, four, five. That's right, five. How many all together? One, two, three, four, five. So they don't have that cardinality yet. So what we try to do in, in early education is play with manipulatives, uh, use again the language. You noticed how I circled. Mm -hmm. Another uh, way to do it is to count them into your hand. Five, and now you have five all together. So children can see that unit of five. Okay. So just, just things that we train on um, to, help, to help teachers understand it's a process. You can't just go from counting to cardinality. You have to go through the steps. Children need to have opportunity and a lot of uh, manipulatives, um, big blocks, small blocks. Anything. They use themselves. You know, I always say a child can can really internalize a concept if they're using their own bodies. So if you have, I'm, I'm the hula hoop queen, so I have hula hoops and I put three children in a hula hoop. There you have it, three together. Or I have three hula hoops and one child in each one. Okay. That's your one-to-one -one correspondence. And it's fun. We're having fun, we're playing. And something like that will further reinforce the concept because of the manipulatives and the concrete exactly. hands-on. It has to That be. is what's gonna happen. That is probably the most important element of them understanding the concept. And the play. That's always fun. <laughs> well, Julie, thanks for coming and Thank hanging you. out with us and doing yeah, a little play with us it. here on Do the Math with uh, a little bit of math with the younger students. That is today's Math in the News. But before I let you go, I just want to say, I know I grabbed you spur of the moment, but I just wanted to present you with that and say thank you for coming and helping us do the math Aww. and explain to some of the educators that deal with these TK, pre-K kids and even kindergarten, first grade even, some of the ideas and resources that are available for these instructors. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming in also. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 530. We'll be back with more right after this. Hey, this season math is still happening in the real world. It's everyone's favorite part of the show. We gotta figure out what's going on here. So I brought my friend Corey to tell us about a super unique place that you may not even know exists here in Kern County. Corey, thanks for taking the time to be with us, man. Appreciate right it. On. Tell me a little bit about what's going on here, what you do, and what, what this place is. It's Crimson, right? This, you guys are here at Crimson Plant One. All right. Crimson Bakersfield Plant One, Plant Two. All right. It's California's largest biodiesel plant. Okay. So we're talking biodiesel today. Yep. Yeah. So what's behind the like biodiesel comes here, or you sorry, you have some raw materials that come here, right? Yeah, we bring in, um, basically these plants can run on any type of feedstock, uh, animal fat, okay. plant, plant oils. Right. And then you take that material that probably nobody else wants. That's right. <laughs> and you do something and make it into a product that people do want. What do you make it into? Diesel grade fuel. Gotcha. It's basically a biodegradable diesel fuel. Wow, that's amazing. So that process is something that everyone wants to hear because you're taking basically a waste product and making something productive out of it. That's right. Right? Yeah. So real quick, how does that work? <laughs> well, that's maybe not a real quick topic. You let's want to go make some biodiesel? Let's do it. Let's, let's go, go make some biodiesel. Let's go. So let's go uh, take a look at what the first process is, okay. right? And then we'll kind of make it. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay on plant one, which is the original plant here at Crimson. Okay and it, we do 22.8 million gallons out of that plant. So we gotta see this place. Yeah, I right. love it. Let's okay. go, let's Sounds go uh, pull a sample. Yeah, let's okay. go pull a sample, see what's going let's on. Let's go. <laughs> All right, Corey, so we're at the next process here, right? And I'm still a little bit interested in what's going on here, but we have a big truck behind us 
And it's full of? UCO. Okay. Which stands for used cooking oil. Used cooking oil, all right. And people probably don't want that still at the McDonald's, so they send it to you. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, this could have came from the streets of Bakersfield. Isn't, oh, there you that, go. isn't that a song? That, that's know. right. That's right. And so we want to know what this stuff looks like, right? Uh, we're going to, yeah. Tony, you want to grab a sample? And so probably not something we want to just drink right out of, right? But this is used cooking oil. Already made some french fries or something. Yeah. They want to get rid of it. And then as a as an initial product, as a raw material for Feed you, stock, yeah. you can use that to make fuel. That's right. Right. He's going to pull a sample with what we call the sledge judge. Okay. And uh, we're going to measure a, a few, few of the constituents that are in there, the impurities. Okay. Um, we're going to measure MIU, which stands for moisture and solubles and unsaponifiables. And then we're also going to measure um, for sulfur. Okay. And um, FFA. And so you want to know a little bit about material that's coming into this facility. We do, just to, if we need to adjust the recipe, right. it's just like making cookies. Right. And so <laughs> if we got higher FFA on a certain recipe, we could um, come out of the first reaction a little high on the free fatty acids and start making soaps. So oh, we wow. can easily start making soap rather than biodiesel. Oh right. my gosh. So at least you have another option if the mix isn't exactly what you want it to be, right? There's another thing you could do with it. Or well, at least I mean, we, we have, we, we like certain blends for certain seasons, basically. Okay. Seasonally, we have to hit, hit a cloud point, and cloud uh, point is basically when uh, impurities basically start precipitating out of the biodiesel. Oh, uh, wow. And can foul fuel filters and... Right, yeah. right. So there really is a pretty long process and knowing what goes into it, exactly the materials that you're getting is going to adjust the, the yeah, recipe that, or the cooking right. process. Yeah, this is, this, this, is, this is the first step. Right. right. So we're going to check and make sure the feedstock hits all the specs. Yeah. We're going to take it out of the truck and put it in the feedstock farm. Okay, oh, so not so appetizing, but there's some good stuff in there. Primo. And is this normally what it looks like, or could it be different oh, no, colors? It could be, look much worse. Okay. This is actually pretty good looking. This is stuff. actually okay. Tony, good job. You got a good looking sample there. I appreciate that part. Because this plant, which is plant one, it can only handle up to a certain level of degradation. It can only handle up to like say 12 and a half percent FFA. Okay. So we're gonna test this to make sure that it fits all those parameters. Gotcha, let's yeah. do that. We know there's some more math to do back in the studio, but when we come back, we wanna analyze this thing at the lab because you never know what might be in that stuff. Back to the studio, Mike. All right, thanks for that, Scott. And also thank you to Crimson Renewable, and we do, will check in with those guys a little bit later on. On set with us also is CC today. We've got Augustia, a fourth grade student at Stockdale Elementary. And you were talking about the science that you like about fourth grade. And we were discussing a little bit about how you miss a little bit of school, but why did you miss school again? So everybody, I find this fascinating. Um, so, like, I was gone. So, but um, where were you? I was in India. See, and I think that's awesome that you had an opportunity to go to India and, I mean, does, does everything you were probably doing, experiencing yeah. there to see family and stuff like that. And so what did you like, because your most recent trip, because you've been there before, but when you were younger, yeah. what would you like to tell us about your trip? So, like, um, I like the places right there and um, my family, so I miss my brothers and sisters, which they were right there. Um, also, I tried to go in the Christmas vacation, but um, we booked the flight before, like, um, we got on December 7th, mm -hmm. but our Christmas vacation was on December 25th. Oh, okay. To January. Well, that's all right, I mean, you get a little extra time, right? Yeah. So. In the meantime, while you were in India, you missed a little bit of schooling and some of the things, but you have been working with your family to get caught up a little bit. So what I'd like you to do is work with Cece right now and kind of explain to Cece what you understand right now okay, come on. as far as these mixed numbers. So we have four and two thirds. So go ahead and write that up there. Four and two thirds. Oh, there we go. Minus three and one third. Okay, so talk to me. Tell me what you know. Tell me what you're going to do. Tell me where you're confused. All of it. So um, we're going to minus the four and three first. So I get one okay. and two and one. So 
Well, what? Do you have any? Probably not one. Wait. Yeah, do the yeah. There you go. One. And so the denominators are the same. So I'm just going to put it right here. So how come I get to leave the denominator the same? How come I don't do 3 minus 3 gives me 0 as my denominator? Do you know why that happens? Um, Because there will be no unit, and it won't make a fraction. OK, and that's, that is definitely true. What does 2 thirds even look like? If you were to draw it, what would it look like? It would look like, um, so there would be you three You want to draw it, and we'll see what it looks like? Yeah, so right. like, this should be a box, and okay. has three sides, and two of them are like colored. OK, awesome. I love that. So you've got two of your thirds that you've filled in. So that's two thirds. OK, so yeah. then when we subtract one third, what does that look like? How would we represent that on our picture? So um, you'll, you'll just um, take these two, and this one will get subtracted. OK, I was going to go another way with it. So let's go, let's go back. And here, I'll, I'll show you kind of what I was thinking. And, that, and I'm sure that that works for you, too. If I've got these two colored, and I need to take one of them away, right? One of the thirds, I'm going to take that away. So I'm going to take away a coloring. I could go ahead and I could erase that. So I'm taking away one third. And now how much do I have left? One. One. I have one of my thirds is now colored. So that was the way my brain was thinking about it. Your brain was thinking about it another way. And that's fine too, right? We, we get the same to the same place. Awesome. Okay. And that's what you want to do, find different ways to solve the same problem. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back to one of your problems you did earlier. Because what you've got written is correct, but we're going to put it in a different form. Okay, so we're so this go is going to be an addition problem. Okay, so we ahead. have 4 and 3 eighths plus 1 and 5 eighths. So it's 1 and 5 eighths. OK, so talk me through this one. Um, so you're going to plus the whole numbers. OK. And I get 5. And then um, I'm just going to add these two because the denominators are same. And if the denominator were different, um, I would cross multiply them. Or I could just add them, probably. Um, so it's going to be 8 and 8. Okay. Um, no, because this would be no, You're a, correct. Because um, this would be a whole number. Right, so go ahead and go ahead and write that, though, first. Go ahead and write it as 8 over 8. Because uh, you're right. If I do that addition, I get 8 over 8. I get 8 eighths. That's correct. Or we could write it um, as six holes. OK, so let's go ahead. I think what, what he was saying, let's go ahead and show me what three eighths looks like. Okay, I like that. And give me three eighths. Show me what three eighths looks like. All right, I like it. Okay, and then we're gonna add five more eighths. So one, two, two three, four, five. So there we can see that nice representation now. All of them, or the whole, or like you said, the whole, right? Eight eighths is the whole. One is now shaded, so that's why we have five, and then one more whole which gets us to six. That's nice. Yeah. I like that. Good. And one thing I want to go back to, so where you had five and eight eighths, underneath that, I want you to write five, where you had five and eight eighths. Yeah. Underneath it, write five and one over one. Does that look familiar? Yeah. OK, because that's what I noticed you wrote the first time. So talk about what that is, and if that means the same thing as what you've got earlier there. Um, probably like. Um, one once should equal a whole number. So I wrote one and one is makes a whole number. Okay. So this, if you add, this could make a one, and if you add it to five, it could make a six. Right, because well, you've done division, right? So eight yeah. divided by eight is one. One. One divided by one is one. What's like twenty-nine divided by twenty-nine? One. Right, so any time we have a fraction with our numerator and denominator the same, we get to 1. So we know we get to 1, 
and as a whole one, and we're good to go. Yeah. And I just wanted to bring that because the way you had it written on the paper, I just wanted to make sure when you go back and look at it again that you rewrite it and just put six next to it. You ready for one more problem? Yep. All right, let's yes. take a look at it. Right. So, James wants to send two gifts by mail. One weighs two and three quarter pounds, two and three fourths pounds. The other weighs one and three fourths pounds. What is the total weight? So we have one and three fourths. And two and three fourths. Okay, I'm going to ask you why you decided it was going to be an addition problem. Um, because you're going to add those stuff. Why? Um, because James told us, um, there were two things and he needed to add them. So it said that he needed the total, right? So yeah, yeah. so the total. Yeah, we're going to add them. Okay, good. So show me what we're going to do here. Yeah, what they weigh together is going to be three and six fourths. And we're done? We're good? Yeah. We're over it. No, we don't need to do anything else. No. Are you really sure? What? Are you really sure? Yeah. Let's look at that six fourths. Show me, draw me a picture of what six fourths looks like. It's an improper fraction. It is an improper fraction. You're right. So let's look at it visually just so we can show the audience what we can see and how we're going to change it into their final answer. So, so we know we have fourths. Yeah. Okay, so we have, but we have six of them. So how are we going to show six fourths? We're going to, um, so multiply these and then plus it on this. So actually, I'm going to go a different way with it. I'm going to say, okay, we're looking at fourths. So we have fourths here. Draw me another box of fourths. Okay, good. Now fill in six of those. Okay, so six fourths is a whole, a whole and two, um, two and two fourths. Or yeah. so if we're gonna okay, so let's do it step by. We'll go step by step. Okay, so we know we've got another hole. So instead of having three holes, we now have how many? Um, six fourths. Six. Um, so so I've got these three, and I've got one more hole. So how many holes do I have? Four. Four. So I know I have four. Ooh, just kidding. Sorry about that. Okay, I know I have one more hole, so I have four. So go ahead and give me the four. Um, and maybe just right here will be good. So we'll just do a four. And then how many fourths do I have left? So this one's already been counted, so that one's done. We added that in. And two fourths. And two fourths, good, we can get that. And have you done reduction? Have you been reducing fractions at all? Simplifying we'll go with or today. Simpl simplifying. simplifying, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Simplify. Have you been simplifying fractions at all? Um, yeah. Okay, so do we know how to simplify two fourths? Yeah. Ah, I like it. Okay, good. Lovely. And we can see it as the picture, right? That we have a half left. Nice, I like it. Good job. I like the extension on that CC so having yeah. him simplify that instead of just leaving it at two fourths. Yeah, we're good. You and technically, job. he could have left it at three and six fourths. True. It's correct. But we like to yeah. make things as simple as possible. Very and true. Simple. So you don't go and say, I would like three and six fourths pounds of turkey or yeah. something, right? You go, I'd like four and a half pounds. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. You like turkey? No. Do you like food? <laughs> what? What's your favorite food? Um, fruit salad. Fruit salad? Yeah. Do you have fruit salad for breakfast or do you have a favorite breakfast food? Um, favorite breakfast food. What do you think your favorite breakfast food is? Um, it can be fruit salad too. I mean. Yeah. Fruit All right. Salad. Well, there you go. Well, you know what? You've just won yourself a meal from our friends at Broken Yo Cafe. And I know they have fruit at Broken Yo Cafe. So hopefully you have the opportunity to go over to Broken Yo Cafe and enjoy your meal. They have breakfast and lunch, I do believe. But I've always been there for breakfast because the old man likes that breakfast over there. Hey, you know what? We're going to go back and check with Scott and see what's happening over at Crimson. Hey, we still got some math in the real world happening. And of course, this 
beautiful product here is what we started with. We just dipped some out of the truck, right? And we want to know what happens and how they clean this stuff up. So I brought my friend Thomas. Thomas, thanks for taking the time with us. Hey, Appreciate it, going? man. What happens in this place? Because it looks awfully official. So over here, we're going to be testing the front line. So any truck that comes in, we want to monitor specific uh, test points, essentially, to, so we can produce the best quality fuel we possibly can. Right. We do have certain limits for those fuels. Right. And so basically, I, as you can see from this bottle, this is a representation of what uh, a collective amount of trucks would look like okay. within our plant. So this is what we are starting with. Right. Now, not so clear, not so clean. Not, um, <laughs> not the prettiest. But when we actually do clean it up, it actually comes out to a nice nice little oil color with no water no sediment right and so this is what we ideally want to start reacting with okay. now the reaction is a, a sterification process where essentially on the fat molecule you're just doing surgery and removing part of that molecule and reattaching the ester group onto it wow. and that's how you produce the biodiesel molecule and so this reaction right here that you're seeing is actually in half um, so the top layer will be distilled biodiesel and the bottom layer will be distilled glycerin. Uh, okay. And this is crude. This is before anything is cleaned up. So this is still right. rough in process reactions. Okay. Now, however, when we go throughout the reaction process, these are our final products. To where we have this nice clear biodiesel yeah. that came from this kind of feedstock. Wow. And so there's definitely a big long process that goes through here. So in this building, what do you test for? Like what, so for instance, what happens over here? Uh, actually, this um, isn't necessarily a test for like the main parts of the fuel. This yeah. is actually a reactor system where we can uh, test for specific feedstock and just do a rough reaction to see how it would actually simulate in the plant. Oh, okay. I got you. That makes sense. All the, right. The test points that we would test for would be for the standard for ASTM G6751. Now, there's a... There's quite a few test points that we uh, test for the test the fuel for. Yeah. One of those will be at this station right here. Okay. And what this station over here? right here is where we would test for cold soil filtration. Okay. Now, in cold weather climates, diesel can freeze, or oh. biodiesel can freeze. So basically from that, we basically hold it in a cold hold, and we warm it back up to make sure those cold impurities are still there, and then we filter it. What it's essentially doing is, is taking a fuel filter and simulating what a fuel filter would be in an engine, right. and to see if that if the fuel will pass through the filter with no restrictions. Yeah, that and totally makes sense. And you want to be able to conduct those tests here yeah, before absolutely. it gets to the point where a vehicle is trying to run on that fuel and get stuck somewhere and they say, hey, it's this bad fuel, it doesn't do what we want it to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, we certify every lot before it even gets pushed to even be available to sold. Right, that totally makes sense. So a lot of testing going on here, a lot of figuring out what's happening mm -hmm. uh, as far as before it goes out the door. Yeah. What else? What else do we have over here? Because I know that we brought our friend Martha. Martha, what is going on in this area here? Because it looks awfully important as well. Yes, so this is actually the most important machine that we have here. Okay. And this one, well, I consider it one of the most <laughs> important ones. And this tests acidity as well as soap content. So here we have two different chemicals and one is an acid and one is a base. Okay. And the way that we titrate an acid, so what we do is we measure acid by doing uh, titrating with the opposite. Right. And we'll titrate it with a base uh, okay. because the opposite of a base is an acid. And when you put them together, you get water and salt. Okay. And so uh, it'll spit out a number that will give you an acidity. And the way that we titrate it here is we have these two chemicals. We have KOH, which is potassium hydroxide, and HCl, which is, hi um, which is hydrochloric acid. Okay. And we load up our samples here. And the reason that we test the acid through every single stage of the process here is because you don't want the acid to corrode your engine, you know, right. your pipes, you don't want it to damage your car. And yeah. so it's very important to also quantify how many soaps we have using our dilutions and using the chemicals that can um, cancel out. So for example, base will cancel out an acid. Right. And so as much base as I use, if I use uh, you know, one milliliter of base yeah. and it neutralizes that acid, that means I have one milliliter of acid. That totally makes yeah. sense. So, so from that acid, raw material, yeah. right, we're bringing it in here to be, figure out what is actually in there, how the tests are going to run, make sure that the product that you're going out with is going to be a good one. Yes. And we want to make sure that we see it, what the rest of that process is after that happens here. Thanks for your time. Of course. Because this looks you. like a really interesting <laughs> place. At the moment, we know we have some more math to do back in the studio, so Mike will be back in a bit. All right, thanks for that, Scott. Also, thank you once again to everybody over at Crimson Renewables. In studio with us, we have Augustia, a fourth grade student from Stockdale who was fortunate enough to be able to go to India, visit some family, and learn a couple of other things. But you're back and ready to go, correct? Yep. All right, back to the board then if you're back and ready to go. Here we go. So you and Cece were working with mixed numbers and simplifying, but now I'm going to throw a little different twist in there for you. 
How old are you? Um, nine and a half. So we're just going to go nine. So put a whole number nine up there. Minus four and, so we're going to have a mixed number. Four and, let's say, there's three of us. So your numerator will be three. And there's five of us all together in the studio, so let's make five the denominator. There's your problem. Okay, so what are your thoughts on how this is going to go? Um, so I'm going to minus the whole numbers. Okay. And so there's nothing to minus with this, so this is just going to be my answer. Okay, so if we do that, what would our answer look like? Um, now I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. And this is going to be a really hard question. What's 10 minus 3? 7. What's 7 plus 3? 10. Okay, so you see that addition and subtraction are always related. And you probably already knew that, right? Yeah. So if I subtract numbers and I get an answer, I should be able to take that answer and add it and get back to where I was, right? Yeah. Okay, so if I look here, and I just kind of just kind of quickly go through this. If I do the 5 and 3 fifths plus 4 and 3 fifths, just kind of in your head, what, tell me what it is that you're going to get. Nine six fifths. I'm gonna get nine and six fifths, which doesn't give me this. So something went wrong, right? And now we just need to figure out what happened, what went wrong. So let's go ahead and get rid of the five and three fifths and let's show what went wrong. So we do need to be able to subtract that three fifths from something. Okay, so we're gonna figure out how to get something so that we can subtract that three fifths. Because we can't just kind of decide we want to keep it. We've got to subtract it. So if I take my nine, because if we think about having nine pizzas, right? When we go to the pizza, pizza parlor and we get nine pizzas, it's already, it's all cut up, right? But we've yeah. got nine holes. Yeah. Okay. So if I have my nine whole pizzas and we eat four of them, we eat four whole pizzas, how many pizzas do we have left? Five. Okay. Now, so we have five but we still need to get rid of that three-fifths. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to say, okay, we're going to take our nine and we're going to break it into eight whole pizzas. So we're going to say we have eight, uh, and you don't have to draw it. It's okay. Go ahead and, and just circle that around and dot it and write the number eight. Okay, and so we're going to say that ninth pizza, so we have eight whole pizzas, we're going to take that ninth one, and we're going to say that it has five slices. So go ahead and give me a denominator of five. Now when you, f that's okay, you got it. Now when you first pick it up from the pizza parlor, you hope that nobody's eating your pizza. So how many pizzas, how many pieces are in that pizza if it's been cut into five pieces? Five. Five, right, so we know we have five. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do, because now if I write minus, three fifth, uh, minus four and three-fifths, so go ahead and do that, so minus four and three-fifths, now I can subtract that last part. I can now have something to subtract that away from. I have that one pizza that's whole and amazing, that's cut into five pieces, and I can take away the three pieces which that represents. So show me my answer now. Lovely. So that's lovely because now when I say, okay, let's add backwards, do we get back to here? Yeah. Okay, and five over five is? One hole. And one hole plus eight more holes is? Nine. Nine. And there we have it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we're just going to break that down so we have something to subtract with. Nice. All right, done. well done. Clear the board because we're moving on to a whole new topic now. Okay. So I guess the, you said one of the things that you're working on in class is geometry with triangles, correct? Yep. So we're going to take a look at a couple of triangles right now in the book that you brought to us, and we're going to have you classify them. So I don't know if you guys want to draw these up there or we can just talk about them as we see them. So the first one has three different lengths of sides. Yeah. So first of all, Talk to Cece about what you know about triangles right now, regardless of you and what's up on the screen. What do you know about triangles? Anything and everything. Like and you the, can just draw stuff up on the board also. Like the angles and um, the names of the, like, 
in that um, picture, it was showing like three different lengths. Mm -hmm. So like that, um, my teacher told me what they're called. So the first one, um, my teacher told me it was a scalene. Okay. So that's my answer for that. Okay, good. Now, I'm going to ask you a really, really basic question. Yeah. How many sides are in a triangle? Three. Always? Um, yeah. Every single time? Yep. How do we know? Do you know what part of that word triangle tells me three? Try. Try. Nicely done. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so we know that we can identify a triangle very easily, the three sides. You are right. That is a scalene triangle. Yeah. What do we know about that next one, number three? It's a... Is so, I don't know what this pronounce is so isosceles isosceles triangle because the I in the first letter um, is just like your eye in your face and we have two eyes so we can remember that by seeing there are two lengths that are same and one is different so that's the isosceles. Isosceles, nicely done. Okay, I love it. And there's one other kind that we might want to talk about. Do you know what that is? Equilateral. Equilateral. And again, how do we know equilateral? How can we know that one? Because the all sides are equal. Okay, so equal, equal. Okay, lateral. What does that mean? Do you, do you know when we talk about lateral, it's usually kind of talking about our sides. So we have our equal sides, equilateral. Nice. So you know about the sides of different triangles. What about angles? So maybe draw some stuff up on the board. Have you learned about angles? Yeah, yeah. so right. um, less than 90 degrees is say a Q angle okay. and exactly 90 degrees is a right angle okay. and bigger than 90 degrees is an obtuse. Okay, and how do we show a right angle? Do you know what the notate, kind of like there's a symbol? The nice, the little square. Good. That shows us that it's a 90 degree angle. Okay. Yeah. Do you have like special ways that you remember the other ones at all, or you just remember? Um. So I just remember them. They're greater okay. than 90 because right. um I have a protractor, okay. so I can put a um from here and check from there. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And I always remember that. It's so cute. It's little. Yeah. It's so cute. Now that's how, every, you know, I mean, it, it just amazes me how many kids are brought up with that. Like, it's so cute. It's so so cute. it's a cute. So it's little. It's so cute. You're telling me big things can't be cute? No. <laughs> big things can't be cute. I mean, you know, you don't walk up and like, oh, oh Mike, oh, you're so cute. But, but baby, you're oh, so cute. Well, I'm sure when I was a baby. Yeah. Well, yes, when you were little, see? When you were little. <laughs> Yeah, they okay. gave you the buzzer on that. They're like, nay, no, nay, no, nay no, no, they that. buzzed you. That was you. Oh, stop with that. that was I you. overrule. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, yeah, I got the same style as I did back then. Oh, All we're right. regressing. Okay. <laughs> here we go. So, I've got a nice problem for you now, Augusta. You ready? Yeah. Let's take a look at this together. Is it possible to draw a triangle that is both obtuse and equilateral? and explain it. Um, so I want you to draw a triangle that is obtuse and equilateral. Um, it's not sure because if you check from each side, from this side, it makes a cute one and from this side it also makes a cute. But if you check from the top, it makes a um, obtuse angle, so probably there's one obtuse and two acutes in that. Okay, so, so yeah, so now we've got to wonder about our sides. Do you think our sides are equal? Yeah. Do you think they're equal? Yeah, mm. kind of. Kind of. I, you know, and, and honestly, when I look at that, I'm almost wondering if that looks more like it's almost all, it's almost a right angle. Yeah. And I don't know about the lengths being the same. Okay, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's do like a really obvious obtuse angle. Show me a really obvious obtuse angle, like the one that you did earlier. That okay, one. so we know for sure that that's obtuse, right? Yeah. Okay, if I connect these, am I going to be able to get the same, are the sides the lengths going to be the same? No. No. How do you know that? Because um, if you make it like this, it's going to, these two sides are going to be short, mm -hmm. and this is going to be long. Right. So there's something, and I'm not quite sure exactly where we want to go with this, but there is a, an idea that if you're looking at your, if you do your protractor, you could do this and start doing um, like lengths of sides, 
that across from each angle kind of tells you how long the side's gonna be. So if you do a triangle and you find the shortest or like the smallest angle yeah. is gonna give you the shortest side. Yeah. And then your biggest angle is gonna be across from your longest side. Yeah. So if I have an obtuse angle, which I know is more than 90 degrees, I know that's gonna be a longer angle than from my other angles yeah. because I can't have three obtuse angles in my triangle, right? Yeah. If I have one obtuse angle, one that's bigger than 90, yeah. I'm not gonna be able to have any more obtuse angles. Yep. So that is not gonna be possible. So another way to think about this, what I want you guys to do is talk about the number of the degrees okay. in a triangle and use that information to prove that you're not going to be able to have obtuse angles in an equilateral triangle. Fantastic, how many angles are in a triangle? Three. So we've got three angles. Do you know what the, de so when we talk about degrees, right, you said more than 90, less than 90. Do you know how many a uh, degrees are in a triangle? Um, Total? Three. Like, so if I were to add up all of my angle, but like, you know, if this is a 90 degree angle, what, do you know how many? It's 180. There's always 180 degrees in a triangle. You've yeah. heard that before or no? Yeah. Okay. So if there's 180 degrees in a triangle, yeah. okay, and we've got three angles, and if it's equilateral, it's equiangular, equi meaning the same, angular meaning? Angle. Angles, right. Okay, good. So if we know that it's equilateral, it's equiangular. So if all my angles are the same, so if I have three angles that are the same, and I yeah. know they have to add up to 180, can you figure out how much each of my angles have to be? How would I do that? Maybe draw one? I sure can. I can do that. Go ahead and get started with that. So just go ahead and give me an equiangular, equilateral, or whatever kind of triangle we got going on up here. Okay, I like it. Not yeah, that's equal. pretty good. Okay, so I know that has to add up to 180, and each angle is the same. Yeah. So what do you think my angles are going to be? Take a guess. So this one's going to be obtuse. Uh, I, I don't, let's not cat, let's not cat, or uh, classify them. Let's just say what is my degrees going to be? What kind of what, how much do you think this might be? Eighty. Okay, fine. So let's call that eighty. We'll just take a stab in the dark for just yeah. a second. Go ahead and write eighty up there. Okay, we said that each of our angles was going to be the same, right? Yeah. So if this one's eighty, how much is this one? Um, it's got to be the same. We said it was the same. Yeah. So it's going to be how much? 180 probably. Well, let's go ahead. So this one was 80, so this one's going to be 80. So go ahead and write 80. And if that one's 80, how much is this one? 80. 80. Okay, now what does that add up to? 80 plus 80 plus 80, do you know? Um, 240. 240, nicely done. Okay, is that 180? Um, no. No, it's 240, right? Yeah. Okay, so we, we went a little high. So we know it's not going to be 80s. Yeah. So what do we think maybe it's going to be instead? Probably you'll add 60 plus 60 plus 60. Exactly right. So we could take the 180 and divide it by 3, which gives us 60, or 60 plus 60 plus 60 gives us. So we know that every single one of these angles has to be 60 degrees. Yeah. And if it's 60 degrees, what is that categorized as? Or what is that called? Um, acute. Acute. So we can have three acute angles. But that's all we can have. And I feel like I went astray on that. But where were that's we going okay, with that? That's okay, because we eventually got back to the eventual question was, is it possible to draw an obtuse ah. angle within an equilateral triangle? You, and the answer and is? No. No, because we're, we're drawing a triangle that has what kind of angles? Equilateral. If they're equilateral, there's what, what, are the, what kind of angles are they? Acute. acute. Yes, they are acute. Right, they're all acute. So there you go. Little. Nicely done on that one. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. We do have one more opportunity to go visit Crimson Renewables and see what Scott is up to. quiet here, Corey. <laughs> we'll definitely be able to hear what's going on. So we've seen your raw materials coming in and we've seen what happens in the lab and what they look for. Yeah. And at the very end, 
What are you producing? We'll see how good you did. Ah, there you go, see what happened there. Look at that. And this can be used to fuel a vehicle, right? Yeah. And get it on down the road. Yeah, that's right. Not exactly like regular diesel fuel, but biodiesel fuel. Well, actually a lot less, you know, it's, it's all about, it's all, it's all about the lowest carbon fuel wins. Okay. This is a 78% reduction in carbon. Right. And that's why we're here. Yeah. California low carbon fuel standard. Yeah. You know? And that's what it's all about. Sure. It's, so um, while we're in the process, we can talk about the last sample that we got. Sure. The last sample had a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. And so, then you were telling me earlier it goes to a storage area, but then you got to clean it, right? Yeah. So that's so samples over here. Yeah. So that sample that we took. Yeah. We wanted to test for the impurities. It looked out. It looked good. Yeah. So we sent it back to the tank farm. Okay. And now it just goes through the process. Okay. And this is a. This is what we call um, stage one and stage two. Okay. And we're basically centrifugally using these disc centrifuges. We are centrifugally removing out the solids, right. the solid impurities. And then over on skid two, at the flash vessel right there, yeah. we're flashing off the water. Yeah. So we get a, a complete reaction. Right. And then from there, it goes into this tank over here. Uh, which is a storage tank, right. and then it just goes through a series of reactions. We have the acid esterification reaction, and then the trans esterification reaction. Oh my God. And from there, you basically wow. have methyl esters, aka biodiesel, yeah, and glycerin. Gotcha. So there's, that's where the whole process comes from. Your your stuff, you have to take out the impurities, and that's solids and liquid or, and water. And so that's what this part does. We also want to see the future. So before we let you go, let's go see what happens. You ready for the this future? Thing is, I want to see the future. Okay, let's see let's it. Go. All right. <laughs> well, Cora, here we are. We're at the top of the future, man. You made and, it. And the product is a little different than before, right? Yeah. Look at that. A little bit more clear, right? And oh, it's, so, like, it's like mountain spring water. This is like this is what really you're shooting for in the end, yeah. right? This is what the new process is going to do. And that's what it's all about: is just taking the most degraded feedstocks yeah. and turn it into highest grade fuel that we can, highest and possible. also the lowest carbon. Yeah, with low, so you use higher temperature and higher pressures to do that, right? It's, yeah, yeah. High yeah. pressure, high temperature. I have learned so much today. Thanks for allowing us to be here today. We want to present you with the uh, famous do the math. Tile. Maybe you can find a place in the plant for that somewhere. All right, love it. Uh, thanks so much for allowing us yeah. to be here. Man, what an amazing place where they make some biodiesel. And, and uh, again, top of the future. You never know what you're going to learn on Do the Math. All kinds of things happening here, but we also know we got to wrap up back at the studio. So, Mike, we'll head it back to you. All right, thanks for that, Scott. We will wrap it up because we have Augustia, a fourth grade student from Stockdale Elementary, in studio with us today. So, uh, do you remember when you were younger using blocks and things to count and learn counting and things like that when Julie yeah. was in earlier? Yeah. yeah. So we do appreciate Julie coming in and spending a little bit of time with us today. Did you learn a little bit of something today? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, simplifying and then doing I a little bit more today. with yeah, yeah the obtuse yeah, yeah. and the equilateral triangle and things like that. So did you have a little bit of fun today also? Yep. Good. Well, that's the key right there. Hey, don't forget, until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and Kern High School District, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.